What actually causes your body to make testosterone? In this video, you're gonna find out exactly that with these testosterone stimulating peptides. This is part three of my natural PED series. In the previous videos, I covered androgens and erythropoietins. Feel free to check them out after this one. As you can see, next up, we have this section, testosterone stimulating peptides. If you wanna find out more about this whole topic of testosterone, check out my full testosterone optimization guide in the description. But now let's talk about testosterone stimulating peptides. These are peptides which are chains of amino acids that increase testosterone, generally working through the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis or the HPG axis. This is the pathway in the body that leads to the testes being stimulated to produce testosterone or sperm. Everything you've ever heard about increasing testosterone acts on some part of this HPG axis. This is central to testosterone production. Here's what the HPG axis looks like. It starts in the brain where kisspeptin neurons in the hypothalamus control the pulsatile release of gonadotropin releasing hormone or GnRH from the GnRH neurons in the hypothalamus. So there's a big pulse of GnRH at regular intervals and those pulses are controlled by kisspeptin. GnRH stimulates the pituitary gland to produce luteinizing hormone or LH. LH travels through the blood to the testicles and stimulates the Leydig cells in the testes to produce testosterone. So that's the HPG axis. The banned substances in this category are all involved in this axis. And those substances are chorionic gonadotropin, luteinizing hormone, gonadotropin releasing hormone, and kispeptin. I will quickly cover chorionic gonadotropin because there's not a whole lot to go into. It's involved in maternal recognition of pregnancy. And when it's injected in men, it helps with the production of testosterone. It acts a little bit like luteinizing hormone, which I'll talk about later in this video. So there's not much need for detail on this substance. For the other three substances, it makes sense to go in order of the HPG axis. So I'll start with kispeptin and then GnRH and then LH. Kispeptin neurons are brain cells in the hypothalamus that produce a peptide called kispeptin. This kispeptin binds to kiss receptors on GnRH neurons in the hypothalamus, which causes them to release GnRH. Like I said earlier, GnRH is the hormone that kicks off the whole HPG axis, eventually resulting in testosterone production. So kispeptin is very important for reproduction and testosterone. It's the central regulator of the HPG axis. Energy availability and leptin signaling are very important for this HPG axis. Leptin is a hormone that's released by white adipose tissue, which is just fat tissue, and this leptin binds to leptin receptors in the brain, and it tells the brain how much energy or calories the body has available. Lots of leptin signaling means that there's lots of energy, and the body is free to put energy into reproduction and testosterone. Small amounts of leptin signaling means there's not much energy available so reproduction should be repressed and energy instead directed towards survival so energy is being conserved. But the thing is leptin signaling isn't necessarily correlated with the amount of leptin there is in the body. People who are very underweight or starving obviously don't have much body fat so they don't have much leptin and there's not much leptin signaling going on in the brain. This makes sense. But obese people have got lots of fat, lots of leptin but their leptin receptors are often insensitive to leptin. So there's not much leptin signaling, even though there's so much leptin in their blood because of all the fat. These people are leptin resistant. This makes them feel hungry and want to eat more food, even though they have lots of energy available in their body fat. And leptin is relevant here because kisspeptin neurons are influenced by leptin signaling. So any disruption to the energy balance, body composition, calories, and leptin signaling is going to mess with kisspeptin. And downstream of that, GnRH, LH, and and testosterone. So starvation, obesity, and leptin resistance will all screw up your testosterone production. So essentially, we need to stay at a healthy body fat percentage and maintain leptin sensitivity. To do this, you should get to about 10 to 15% body fat if you're a man. So if you're losing weight to get there, which most of us will be, you want to use a small deficit of like 10 to 20% below your maintenance calories to slowly lose weight without messing up your leptin signaling. So if your maintenance calories are about 2000 calories a day, then you want to try and be at a net intake of 1600 to 1800 calories per day. I really recommend doing some cardio exercise to help you get into a deficit. This is good for your metabolic health and it also means you can eat a little bit more while still being in a caloric deficit. So for example, if your maintenance is 2000 calories, you can eat 2000 calories and then burn 200 to 400 calories through exercise. So that allows you to eat a little bit more while still losing weight. 
And in my opinion, that makes it much more sustainable than like really reducing and restricting your food intake. And you also definitely need to be strength training and building muscle. Muscle is a very good type of tissue to have in terms of your metabolic health. I've got loads of videos about building muscle on my channel, a couple of workout programs if you need some guidance with that. So you get to a healthy body fat percentage, good body composition, and you also need to have good leptin signaling. You can do this by avoiding chronic caloric restriction sleep well, lower your cortisol, build muscle and exercise, this is always good, and eat some dietary fiber, especially if you're obese. Essentially, you need to stay at a healthy body weight, not starving yourself and not being overweight and overeating. So that mostly covers the energy balance part of the kisspeptin equation. So what else influences kisspeptin signaling? Well, your circadian rhythm is a big one. There's a region in your hypothalamus called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, and this receives light signals from the eyes and basically synchronizes synchronizes the brain and the body with the external light environment. It is the master regulator of your circadian clock, your internal biological clock. And kisspeptin neurons, like most other things in the body, are controlled by the circadian rhythm. If your sleep is irregular, if you're looking at bright blue screens at night and staying indoors all day instead of getting outside in the sun, your circadian rhythm is going to be messed up and your kisspeptin signaling is going to be disrupted because of that. And then downstream of that, your testosterone production is going to be messed up up as well. Not to mention that leptin signaling, as I just talked about, that's also controlled by the circadian rhythm. So that's another way that a messed up circadian rhythm is going to disrupt your kisspeptin and your testosterone. So fixing your circadian rhythm is something really important and most people have a disrupted circadian rhythm and fixing this is going to have huge returns. To do that, you should go outside and get morning sunlight in your eyes and ideally on your skin at sunrise if you can, but definitely within an hour of waking up, go outside and do the same at sunset and at least once in the middle of the day. You should limit artificial light at night. So since the invention of the light bulb, you know, we've been able to have quite bright lights even all throughout the night, whereas throughout all the rest of history, all we would have had is fire, you know, candles and fireplaces and things like that. The artificial lights that we use today have a lot of blue wavelengths in them and green whereas candles have a lot more red light in them which isn't so disruptive to our circadian rhythm and to our sleep routine. So your nights should be dark and you should really limit blue and bright lights. So you can use blue light blocking glasses and apps on your phone although really you shouldn't be using screens before bed. You can light your house with dim red lights or even candles. That would be the ideal for your circadian rhythm and I've noticed myself recently that when I light my house with candles I get sleepier so much easier compared to even having having warm light bulbs with zero blue light coming out of them. Candles are really good for improving your sleep, improving your circadian rhythm. You also need to keep a consistent sleep schedule, so waking up and going to bed at the same time pretty much every day, including the weekends, because your body doesn't care whether it's a weekday or a weekend. That's a human artificial construct. Your body wants to wake up in a regular pattern. Your sleep environment needs to be optimized. That just means dark, like pitch black, as dark as possible, cool and silent, or at least as quiet as you can get it without sounds to disturb you and wake you up. Every day you should eat your meals at the same times, so have set times for your meals, and that provides an external cue that tells your body what time of day it is, and it helps to synchronize the body with the circadian rhythm. When you eat at random times, your body is lacking that consistent signal of what time of day it is, so your circadian rhythm is going to be thrown off a little bit. Definitely don't eat big meals close to bedtime, because that digestion can mess up your sleep, and same with exercise. Exercise at the same time every day, and don't exercise like right before you go to bed because that's going to keep you awake. Ideally for circadian health you work out in the morning. Don't drink caffeine after midday because that stays in your system for a long time and it might keep you awake at night. Avoid alcohol and if you can avoid big disruptions to your sleep schedule, things like shift work or jet lag. And now a really interesting point, getting UVB light on your skin and in your eyes can influence your kisspeptin through alpha MSH. So this is alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone. It's part of the melanocortin system which is a very interesting set of peptides and receptors that are involved in energy balance, appetite, sexual function, skin pigmentation, and inflammation. Really, really interesting overlaps all within this same system of molecules. When your skin is exposed to UVB light, which is midday sunlight, melanocytes in the skin produce a peptide called POMC, and then that is cleaved into alpha MSH. And in the skin, alpha MSH stimulates melanin production to darken the skin. Alpha MSH is also produced in the brain when UVB light enters the eyes, and there's some of 
evidence that UVB light, even on the skin, can increase alpha MSH in the brain as well. And in the brain, this alpha MSH can stimulate kispeptin neurons, and therefore it can affect the whole reproductive axis downstream of that, including testosterone. So the skin and the brain and the eyes, they're all in kind of direct communication with each other. The light inputs to your eyes and your skin affects your brain and vice versa. So you should be getting direct sunlight on your skin and in your eyes to optimize your alpha MSH production, kispeptin, and all the stuff downstream of that. No sunscreen and no sunglasses. Obviously, don't burn yourself and don't stare directly at the sun. Too much of anything is bad. You need the right dose. Just being outside for some period of the day is generally good enough. But UVB light only penetrates the atmosphere at midday when the sun is above an angle of 30 degrees in the sky. So that only happens during midday in the summer months. And the lighter your skin is, the less sun you need. And just an interesting side note about alpha MSH. Some people take melanotan, which is an analog of alpha MSH. It basically does the same thing in the body. And as melanotan increases skin pigmentation, so it gives you a tan. And it also suppresses your appetite and enhances your libido. So that's showing this overlap between all of this melanocortin system it's really fascinating, like skin pigmentation, libido, appetite, all of this stuff is related through the same system. So just to summarize so far, kispeptin, you should get to 10 to 15% body fat. Don't starve yourself and don't get obese either. You need to be in a healthy body weight. Build muscle and do cardio. Sleep well, fix your circadian rhythm. Lower your cortisol and spend some time outside every day, especially at sunrise, midday and sunset. Other than energy balance and light, there are a few other things that influence kispeptin signaling. There's a negative feedback loop between the downstream hormones and kispeptin. So estrogen, testosterone, GnRH, all of them inhibit kispeptin neurons so that they don't go crazy and keep telling the body to make more and more of these hormones. The body kind of regulates its own production so that things don't get out of hand. If you take steroids, your body detects that there's way too much testosterone in the system and it shuts down the natural production of testosterone by inhibiting the HPG axis, including kispeptin and GnRH. Prolactin is another hormone that inhibits kispeptin. So prolactin is something that you want to keep fairly low. And then as usual, there's the generic advice of like lowering cortisol, lowering inflammation and avoiding drugs and alcohol. The next step of the HPG axis is gonadotropin releasing hormone or GnRH. I touched on this a little bit earlier since it's controlled by kispeptin. GnRH is made in the hypothalamus and it stimulates the gonadotropes in the pituitary gland to make luteinizing hormone. Luteinizing hormone is the next step in this pathway after GnRH. So to make sure that your GnRH release is normal and healthy, your leptin system needs to be normal. As I explained earlier, leptin acts as a signal of how much energy the body has. So being very skinny or very fat has the same problem of messing up your leptin signaling, leading to problems with testosterone and fertility through the HPG axis. So basically, again, you need to be at a healthy level of body fat and make sure that you're leptin sensitive. You need to get enough protein in your diet and enough amino acids. GnRH, being a peptide, is made of amino acids. Some amino acids are also precursors to compounds like dopamine that regulate GnRH secretion. Protein also is signals satiety to the brain it means that you're full up you've got enough energy and that means the hypothalamus is free to produce GnRH for testosterone and reproduction so again we're seeing that energy balance is important for the production of these reproductive hormones insulin leptin satiety hunger all of that is relevant of course you need all of the micronutrients you can check out my recent video on micronutrients I cover the best sources of each of them and there's my nutrition guide if you want an in-depth look at micronutrients and pretty much everything else there is to know in the nutrition space micronutrients are going to be important for optimizing everything on this peptide hormone list. Exercise is always good. It improves energy balance, which as we know is good for this whole HPG axis. Don't overdo it though, because that could lead to chronically increased cortisol, dropping your body fat like dangerously low, and energy deficiency. You may have heard that female athletes who overtrain from a young age often have delayed puberty or amenorrhea, which is where they don't have any periods because their brain perceives them to be in such a low energy state that they can't afford to reproduce. Basically, don't be stupid, don't overtrain like many hours a day, every day, eating nothing but chicken and rice. In terms of exercise, you should strength train two to four times a week and do some cardio at least a few days a week. As usual, you want to keep stress low most of the time. Cortisol is good for short-term performance boosts, as we'll see later in this series, because people actually take cortisol derivatives and stimulants. But chronically elevated cortisol messes pretty much every system in the body up, including GnRH. GnRH is one 
one part of a larger system and you need to make sure that all of the other hormones in your body are in a good place. Lots of men have got high prolactin and high estrogen, for example, which both mess with GnRH. You can lower your prolactin with vitamin B6, either through a diet or supplementation with P5P. Lowering stress and optimizing dopamine, those are all going to help your prolactin. And you can lower your estrogen by reducing body fat, avoiding endocrine disrupting chemicals like plastics, toxic hygiene products, heavy metals and pesticides. You can consume some natural aromatase inhibitors, which will reduce estrogen, such as cruciferous vegetables, chrysin and resveratrol, and also improving liver function to help with estrogen excretion. As usual, avoiding excessive alcohol or caffeine. Alcohol can inhibit GnRH and caffeine can increase cortisol, which suppresses GnRH. And then lastly, sleeping well. Like I've said many times, sleep and the circadian rhythm are central because GnRH is released in a pulsatile manner, which means it's released regularly in a rhythm controlled by the circadian rhythm. If your sleep and your circadian rhythm are out of whack, it throws off this regular production of GnRH and loads of other functions in the body as well. So sleep well, get sunlight in the day, keep your evenings and nights dark as possible, fix your circadian rhythm. This is really non-negotiable. You can have the most perfect diet and exercise and supplements, but if your body isn't synchronized to the natural rhythms of the sunlight cycle, you're never going to be in peak health. Interestingly, animals that have become more dominant in their social hierarchy develop higher levels of GnRH. So increasing social status and dominance in the hierarchy could be a way to increase GnRH and then downstream of that, LH and testosterone. Things like competition, getting promoted in your career into positions of more influence and power, these are probably going to beneficially impact your GnRH. So we've covered kispeptin and GnRH and next is luteinizing hormone. And this is what actually stimulates the Leydig cells in the testes to produce testosterone. So this is the step that directly causes testosterone to be made. So this is pretty important. If your testes are in good health, then a high level of LH is going to be effective at getting them to produce lots of testosterone. So here's how you can optimize your luteinizing hormone production to maximize testosterone. A lot of this is pretty much the same advice as for GnRH. As usual, consume healthy fats, lots of micronutrients and plenty of protein. Stay at a healthy body weight. You definitely don't want to be obese. Exercise, of course. Don't restrict calories excessively and also don't overeat and don't overtrain. You should maintain insulin sensitivity with keeping a healthy body weight, lifting weights, doing aerobic exercise and high intensity interval training, eating a low glycemic index foods, having some fiber in your diet, minimizing refined carbs. Intermittent fasting can also be quite useful for managing insulin throughout the day. You need to get plenty of magnesium and chromium in your diet. If insulin is a big problem for you, then you can consider supplementing with berberine and of course avoiding chronic caloric restriction. LH is also going to be helped by getting lots of sleep, having low level of stress and avoiding endocrine disruptors. And now the most interesting part probably, there are some foods and supplements that can help to increase LH. A lot of testosterone boosters actually seem to work by increasing LH, which then increases test production from the testes. So some of these LH boosting foods are zinc from things like oysters, ginger, onion, garlic, saffron, potentially DSP aspartic acid and ashwagandha and there are many more but these are decently well supported by the literature and a lot of anecdotal evidence so those are the testosterone stimulating peptides kispeptin gnrh and lh if you follow the things that i've described in this video you're going to get these peptides in a pretty good place if you still have low testosterone after optimizing these hormones there's a good chance that you have poor testicular health which will require some slightly different strategies to fix in the next section are corticotrophins and then a big video Video on growth hormone which is going to be pretty exciting if you want more like this check out my testosterone optimization guide for the diet side of things my nutrition guide is really good it's currently available for pre-order where you get access to the micronutrient section which is probably the most important section but that's it for this video if you have any other tips share them in the comments below and i'll see you in the next video